church and our online family and friends. Thank you so much for joining us for Bible study on tonight. Our scripture tonight will come from number 6 verses 25 through 26 from the New Living Translation. And I know New Beginning Church, y'all know that very well. That's number 6, 25 through 26 from the New Living Translation. And it reads, may the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you peace. And I don't know about you, but I want God's favor and I want his peace. So what would make God smile on us? God smiles on us when we love him supremely. God smiles on us when we trust him completely. God smiles on us when we obey him wholeheartedly. God smiles on us when we praise and thank him. So there you have it. If you want God to smile on you, that means that uh, we have to love him, we have to trust him, obey him, Praise him and thank him. Our song for tonight is God has smiled on me because God has smiled on me. to come before you. Lord, we thank you, Father God, for being our lead, our guide. We thank you, Father God, for blessing us and keeping us even in our right minds right now. We thank you, Lord, for blessing conditions and blessing situations to be as well as they are, Father God. We thank you, Father God, for another Bible study, the first of the year, the first of a, another opportunity, Father God, to lift your name, to share your word, and bless, Father God, you in the midst of it. Lord, we thank you, Father God, for you are good and you are God. 
We praise you, we honor you, Father God, and we pray that you speak to us on tonight, that your words will be clear, your words will be relevant, and that your words, Father God, will penetrate our hearts and bless us to run and tell others about the goodness of Jesus Christ. It's in the strong, mighty, powerful, anointed name of Jesus the Christ we pray and we ask it all. Amen. And thank God. about you, but he's been sure enough at home, they would say, sure enough good. He has been sure enough good to me. Amen. Thank you, Sophia. Thank you, Sophia, for being our maestro for tonight. Well, we thank God for Sophia. Amen. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Our attention tonight will be on prayer. This is our month of prayer, the whole month of January. On Wednesday night, we focus on prayer. So our scripture for tonight will be found in Luke chapter 11 in the New Testament. Luke chapter 11. We will land on verses 5 through 10. Luke chapter 11 verses 5 through 10. And the Lord has spoken in a new way to me when I read this particular pericope. And I want to share it with somebody tonight. I want to share it. I want to share what God has said to me on tonight. I want to share my convictions of Jesus the Christ. And that's what we ought to be about. We ought to be about sharing our convictions of what we believe about the Christ. Amen. Amen. So I want to share again. Thank you for the opportunity to share with you uh, my convictions on tonight. When you look at Luke chapter 11, it begins with the model prayer. This is the model prayer, not the Lord's prayer. Uh, Matthew chapter 6 and Luke chapter 11 tells us about the model prayer. This prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. It is the model prayer. It is the example of prayer. When you want to find Jesus' prayer, the, the Lord's prayer, you look at John chapter 17, then you will find the Lord's prayer. This is the prayer that he prayed in the garden right before his death. Amen. So John chapter 17 gives us the Lord's prayer. For many, many years, we've always called this passage, uh, this first pericope, we've always called it the Lord's prayer. But it is a model. It is an example. It is a, a way we are to pray. So when you look at verses one through four, you will find what we know as the model prayer, the example of prayer. So we're looking at verses five through 10, but let me make sure I bring us up to speed. Uh, Luke chapter 11, verses one through four, it says, now it came to pass as he was praying in a certain place. One writer says, says that we ought to learn to pray like Jesus. In the book, Fix My Prayer Life, the book that we went through on last year during the month of January and February, the author on page 107 talks about we ought to pray like Jesus. We ought to learn to pray as Jesus prayed. So it says, now it came to pass as he was praying in a certain place, so we ought to have a certain place by which we ought to pray, in which we ought to pray, brother. We ought to have a certain place. I know, I hear you, and you are right. We ought to pray everywhere we go. We ought to pray all the time. But you ought to have a designated place that you go in your house or in your community to talk with God. I mean, you, you ought to pray in your going, you ought to pray at work, you ought to pray in your day-to-day -day routine, you ought to pray at school, but there ought to be some quiet time, a quiet place where you get along with nobody but you and God. Mm -hmm. Couples ought to pray together. Couples are united when they pray together. Families ought to pray together. Families are united when they pray together. A family that prays together stays together, right? 
So families ought to pray together. But when it comes to prayer for your own personal prayer life, you ought to have a prayer ground in which you pray. It says, now it came to pass as Jesus was praying in a certain place. He had a certain place where he prayed. Then it says, when he ceased, that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John has taught his disciples to pray, as John also taught his disciples to pray. So prayer ought to be the way Jesus wanted it to be. If we're going to get close to God, we have to mimic Jesus Christ. Jesus has to be our example. So the first thing he says in Luke chapter 11, we ought to have a praying, a praying ground. We ought to have a certain place. And then he says, when we cease, we ought to make sure that we've spent some time in prayer. And when he says he ceased, it means that he spent laboring time in prayer. In order to cease, you have to stop. In order to cease, you have to be doing something. In order to cease, you have to be in labor. So Jesus, and even in Jesus' personality, as we know throughout the gospel, uh, Jesus spent time in prayer. So we have to have a prayer place. We have to have a place in prayer where we pray regularly, and we ought not say, Lord, let me down to sleep. Pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. That ought not be our weekly or our daily prayer. Because the fact of the matter is, if you lay down to sleep and you don't wake up, <laughs> if your soul wasn't fixed before you went to sleep, it won't be fixed after you go to sleep. If your soul wasn't fit for God to take it before you went to sleep, then it won't be fixed after you fall asleep. Somebody got a question like that. What am I just saying? I'm saying that your prayer life ought to be of such and your salvation ought to be of such that you know Jesus and Jesus know you. I've said oftentimes, prayer is a dialogue. It is communication with God. A dialogue means that you talk to God, God talks to you. It ought to be a back and forth thing. How does God talk to us? He talks to us by way of his word. He talks to us by way of his son. And he talks to us by way of his Holy Spirit. So if God is going to talk to us, we ought to use the Bible as our guide. If God is going to talk to us, we know that the Holy Spirit is present. And if God is going to talk to us, it is revealed through his Son. The Hebrew writer says that, that God reveals himself now through his Son, Jesus Christ. So he prayed, and he prayed he prayed and he made a lifestyle of prayer. We ought to pray like Jesus. The fact of the matter is, if you don't pray, I guarantee you won't get what you need. I guarantee you, if you do not pray, then your prayer will not be answered. You need a lifestyle, a lifestyle of prayer. If you don't ask God, then you won't receive. You can't get prayer answered unless you pray. So he prayed. The Bible says, and when he ceased, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. As John also taught his disciples to pray. So if we're going to have a teacher of prayer, who should be our teacher? Jesus, right? Jesus should be the one that's our teacher. So he gives us this model prayer in Luke chapter 11, verses 1 through 4. He gives us this model prayer. He says, so he said to them, verse number 2, Luke 11, verse number 2. So he said to them, when you pray, say this. When you pray, pray like this. When you pray, pray by this example. Again, it confirms that this is a model prayer. This is a way, this is a way we ought to pray. So he says, 
our Father in heaven. This is New King James, so I know most of us in this room are used to saying, our Father who art in heaven. So King, New King James says, our Father in heaven. Same thing. Our Father who exists in heaven, our Father who resides in heaven, our Father whose thrones in heaven, our Father whose resident is in heaven. He says, when you pray, first of all, our Father. What does that mean? That means he's somebody else's Father. That means he's our Father. But it is personal to us, so we ought to pray in a personal way. He says, our Father who art in heaven, there's no doubt who Father he's talking about, and there's no doubt where the Father is located, and there's no doubt who belongs to this Father. Every born-again believer, God belongs to you, you belong to God. He says, when you pray, pray like this. Hallowed be your name. Or hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be your name. Hallowed. What does hallowed mean? What is he talking about? Hallowed be your name. What is he saying to us? Holy. Holy. Anything else? Honored. Set apart. We honor your name. We set your name apart. Your name is holy. Your, your name, Lord, is above every name. There is no name that compares to the name of God. So first of all, you got to give God the glory in your prayers. Every time you begin your prayer, you ought to begin by honoring God. So I honor God. God, I honor you today. God, you are God. Now this is to God, regardless if he gave you what you want. This is God that you rejoicing in him even because of who he is, not what he's done. We know he's an awesome God. We know he's done great things. But God, we want to honor you because you are just God. Amen. Because he's God. I mean, the church ought to catch on fire when we honor God. When we praise him, when we glorify him. The church ought to catch on fire. We ought to glorify God in our bad times, in our struggling times, when we've been begging God, we go, I dare you to glorify him. I dare you to honor him. What parent don't want a child, what parent doesn't want their, their children to honor them? Well, that's how God is also, right? I oftentimes tell the story of my daughter when she was two, three, I mean, I, I was at that time I was losing my, my hair was letting go. <laughs> it was letting go to come back no more. If I was ghetto, I would say it was letting go to come back no more. So what she would do, she saw the bald spots and the cow licks. Y'all know what cow licks are? Uh-uh. I got nodding of heads. Okay, so the bald spots were coming until I said, wow, let me just clip all this off, right? Mm -hmm. So what she would do to show me her honor after 12 hours of graveyard, I'm laying on the couch and I'm, I'm nodding in and out while she's trying to play, she would start rubbing my head and say, Daddy, you know you're the best dad in the world. Mm -hmm. You know you're such a great daddy. At the age of three, four, I mean, daddy, you are the greatest daddy in the world. And I knew then she was setting me up for a blessing, not for me a blessing, but for her a blessing. And so when we begin our prayer, we ought to let God know, God, you are the greatest God in the world. There is no God like you. You are God and you are God alone. At that point, we ought to throw up our hands and say, Lord, we thank you for just being God, just being who you are. You are magnificent. You are wonderful. You are glorious. You are the mighty God. You're the great king. God, we thank you for just being God. That's before you ask for anything. Let's say, God, we say hallowed to your name. God, your name is glorious. Your name is precious to us. You are the wonderful God. There is no God like you. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. 
God, you rule in my life. There is a kingdom in heaven, and we know what it looked like, somewhat what it looks like by God's word. And in order for there to be a king, there must be a kingdom. In order for there to be a kingdom, you can't have a kingdom without a king. And so we want God's kingdom to come. The atmosphere in heaven, God bring it to planet Earth. Right now, we need, we need God's presence. Can't you see? Over 400 men can't even make a decent decision. And they keep doing the same thing over and over again. We didn't make it the last four times. Let's try fifth. Am I talking to anybody in here? I mean, not only are we going for less and less and less and less, it's, it's kind of like church folk now. I'll show you, but not tell you. So we've got grown men that's corrupting their mind that give no glory to God. I am the God on the block is what they're saying. And if I can't make it as your God, I'll put somebody else up. Maybe they can make it as your God. But we want God's atmosphere on heaven. And I mean on earth as it is in heaven. We want the same atmosphere in heaven, the same king in heaven to come to planet earth. The same atmosphere to come to planet earth. Let me tell you, we need some heavenly atmosphere on planet Earth right now. We need it right we, no, Lord, not another second. Songwriter said, Lord, I need you now. Not another week, not another day, not another hour, not another minute. Lord, I need you now. God, I need your presence. Then he says, your will be done. God, I know what my will is, you know what my will is, but God, you know better than I know. When I was taking the Christmas lights down today, they, they came on a spool and they had two little spikes sticking out of it. And when, it, when, I, when I got to the spike, I knew to put, I, I didn't take them off, but I knew how to put it back on, right? So I knew that the spikes were sticking out there so I could put the cable there and then I could easily roll it up. But when I got to the point where I got to the other side, there's another spike sticking out of there. So I said to myself, the engineer had to know what he was doing because he's an engineer. But I broke that spike off because it got in my way. So what I said is, I'm a better engineer than that engineer. Are you with me? So I engineer all the time. So I broke that one off. And then when I started rolling up, the one spike got in my way, so I unrolled all of them and threw the whole spool in the trash. All she wanted was to get them off. So I threw the whole spool in the trash. I'm a better engineer than that engineer. I don't know who came up with such thing anyway. So I was imposing my will. And then the architect who put the spool, put the, the wire around the tree, the architect that, that wrapped the tree, the, the construction engineer that wrapped the tree, the technician that wrapped the tree, Sister Brown. You know, in order for it to come off Sister Whitlock, it has to go on a certain way. So I'm trying to take it off. And then I realized it went up the tree. Then around the tree. Then it went back across the tree. Then around the tree. I caught it. I caught trouble trying to get it. So I said, oh, heck. I'm going to wrap them up like I do an extension cord. I'm going to put them together. Put them in a nice little compact box. So when I get ready to pull it out, I take that in and it just come right on out. Because I'm a better engineer. And plus, I'm the one doing it. <laughs> Are you with me? So, so I had to impose my will. And that's what we do today. We impose our will on God. Whereas we ought to be inviting God's will on planet Earth. We ought to say, God, 
this is what I want, this is how I want it, and this is when I want it, and Lord, I need you to do it. And some people, some places, and I prayed it too, Lord, I need you now, I need you right now, Lord, deliver in the name of Jesus. And we ought to pray that prayer. But we ought to do like Jesus. Remember, we're trying to learn how to pray like Jesus knows how to pray. Like Jesus prays, right? So we ought to come to the conclusion, not my will, your will be done. Who remember Jesus making that statement? Anybody? Did Jesus make that statement? Well, I'm making it up. When did Jesus make that statement? When he played in the garden. What was happening when he prayed in the garden? Why would, why would he even have to say, not my will, your will? You know, the, 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 the gospel writers use the, the phrase cup. Jesus says, take this cup away from me. Deliver me from this cup. When he talks about cup, he's talking about the situation he's in, right? And what was the situation? He was on his way to Calvary. Now, Jesus knew when he came to planet Earth, he was headed to Calvary, right? But remember, hypostatic union, hypostatic union, hypostatic union, right? He is God, and God knew he was coming to planet Earth to die on Calvary. But he's human, and the human said... Lord, I can't do this about these stiff necks. <laughs> For these stiff necks. They're not going to do right anyway, God. Jesus says, take this cup away from me because I, I'm, I'm not going to do this. I don't want to do this. And finally he says, not my will, but your will be done. So we ought to glorify God. We ought to invite God's atmosphere, God's kingdom on earth. And then we ought to get to a point in our lives where we say, Lord, not my will. Your will be done. And when I honestly prayed that prayer several times, guess what happened? God's will was better than my will. We walk out there and we do things or say things or act a certain way, but when we turn it over to God, we find out that God's will is better than our will. What God wants for us turns out in the end better for us. It's better. It's, it's, it's easier. It's God looking out for us. And when God looks out for us, he looks way down the road. He has the finish line in sight before we even start running the race. How I many of you had to explain to your children every now and then that you, you got a better idea than they have? Have, have anybody ever had to explain to their children, I know more about this thing called life than you do? God has really, believe it or not, Sophia, God has really placed children in families so families and adults can look out for those children. Believe that. Believe that parents really know what they're doing. I also believe that parents have made their mistakes and they don't want you to make the same mistakes. That's right. I mean, every mistake I made, I hid it from my parents. <laughs> because guess what? I didn't want them to say, I told you so. <laughs> and when you're a parent, you got the right to say it. I didn't say if you're a wife, I said you, when you're a parent, you got a right to say it. <laughs> Y'all get that when you get home. So we want God's will to supersede our will. Jesus said, this is how we ought to pray and this is how we ought to have it in our heart. He says, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Don't you know if God's will was, doing, was being done on earth, we wouldn't have wars, rumors of wars, global warming, earthquake in difficult places and never seen places before. If God's will, don't you know we wouldn't have school shootings if it was God's will? Mm -hmm. If God's will was being done. Mm -hmm. When I tell children, teenage children, that when we went to school, we had two things early in the morning. We had prayer. The whole school shut down for prayer. Mm -hmm. They look at me like, what? You are old. I said, you're right, because they hadn't done it for a long time. 
And then we would have the Pledge of Allegiance, right? That's right. So people really majored in calling on God when I was in school. Even during the era of desegregation, people were really majoring in calling on God. It was a thing that we knew going to happen. We knew it was going to happen. We knew when we got to school, there was going to be a, a bell that warns you to come inside or tells you to come inside. Then there's going to be another bell so everybody sees all that they're doing. And they bow their head and call. The atmosphere, was, we didn't have any burglar alarms. We didn't, we didn't have, we couldn't afford it, one thing. We didn't, we didn't have any metal detectors. And we didn't even have computers. You know I'm ancient. We carried these big old books and the smallest one was two inch tall. We had lockers that we had to walk down the hallway and go from we put two in there and take two out. But God was handling things and he was handling well. I mean, the biggest thing that children did, I mean, the biggest bad, the worst thing that a child did was put a tack in a teacher's seat. You got three days for that. I mean, we, I mean things that got us sent to the office was blowing spitballs through a straw. Children these days don't even dream of it. Mm -hmm. that, that's, that's, that's child's play. Mm -hmm. I remember teacher, teacher was telling me something, and I said something to her, and I must have touched her hand, and she, I mean, she just went off on me. She thought I touched her the wrong way. But now we have metal detectors, we have police officers. Our janitor was our police officer. Mm -hmm. The coaches. You, if you got sent to the coach, it was like getting sent to the office. It was about three men on campus. The janitor, the coach, and maybe a male school teacher. And they, they held the security tight. And children understood. So we have to understand that we want God's atmosphere, God's kingdom, God's will, and the praises unto God on earth as it is in heaven. In heaven, they don't negotiate praise. <laughs> the Bible says all day long, because there's no darkness, right? All day long, in our minds, as, as we can see it, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, the, the angels are bowing down before the throne of God, crying, holy, 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 hallelujah to the Lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. If we could get back to just where we were, and you know, we still had bad things happen, but if we could just get back where we were and be serious about it, then we will honor God that way. That's why God says, when I shut the rain down, when there are no cattle in the stall, when there are no vegetables and, and no fruits growing on the vine, if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves, yes, yes. pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then heaven will heal you and we will hear from heaven and God can heal the land. Amen. The problem is the saints are not diligent in prayer. So he goes on to say, on earth as it is in heaven, give us this day our daily bread. Now he said all these things before you ask for anything. Then he says, give us this day our daily bread. He's just showing us the structure of prayer. This is the structure, our daily bread. Before you ask for anything, make sure you cover these things first. And check out what he says. Give us this day our daily bread, not our weekly bread, not our yearly bread. Some people pray you know how churches get together and they pray through midnight? Mm -hmm. on, on watch night, they pray. They start at midnight and they pray the, the new year in. Some people don't pray since then. <laughs> we, we are day four now. Some people had not even talked to God since then. And then that night when the preacher prayed, he prayed. <laughs> they didn't pray. And now we expect him to give us annual bread. 
monthly bread, weekly bread. The, Jesus says when you pray, you ought to have a connection with him that's so close and such fellowship with him until you come to him daily and really all day in a tough situation. So give us our daily bread. Day by day bread is what he says. Give us our day by day bread. So in other words, if we pray for daily bread today, in the morning we ought to be praying for daily bread. The problem is we've gotten so spoiled, we can look in the refrigerator, the deep freezer, the stove, the microwave, and just pull it out. Now we spoil. Mm -hmm. So we don't pray for it. Pray for our daily needs. He said day by day. Okay, so he says, and then forgive us for our sins, for we also forgive everyone who in, who is indebted to us. So we forgive other people for their sins or their trespasses or their debts against us. And then God forgives us as we forgive others. The problem is we're not ready to forgive people. Matter of fact, we want to hold it down as long as we can. And every time I see them, I get wrinkles in my face. <laughs> every time I see them, I clench my fists. Mm -hmm. Every time I see them, it reminds me of stuff and I grit my teeth. Because forgiveness is not on my agenda. But as we forgive, God forgives us. I told you something, that when you don't forgive, it's like putting somebody in prison. The problem with putting somebody in prison, you got to stay there with the key. You got to hold them in there. So you can't accomplish anything and you're going to make sure they don't accomplish anything. But forgiveness lifts the weight off of you. That's right. And you move forward. And you just move forward. So forgive us as we forgive others. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one or forgive us uh, and then deliver us from the evil one that comes upon us. Lord, don't let us fall into temptation. Because when we fall into temptation, we are, if we yield, then that temptation becomes sin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he says to us, deliver us, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Only God can deliver us from the evil one. Who's the evil one? The devil, the devil Satan, Lucifer, right? So let's look at uh, verses five through eight. He says to us, and he said to them, which of you have a friend and go to him at midnight? Now that's a problem for somebody right there. Go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves. That's another problem right there. For a friend of mine has come to me on his journey, and I have nothing to set before him. Now you're asking me to give you something to give somebody else. That's another problem. <laughs> Y'all see these issues here? <laughs> this is the real issues here. Verse 7. And he will ask from within. He doesn't even, that's another problem. He doesn't even open the door and let me in. <laughs> he will answer from within. And say, do not trouble me. He said, get away from here. It's another problem. The door is now shut and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give to you. And New King James, it comes with a question. And King James is no question. It's a statement that says, I can't rise and give to you. My children in bed, the door is shut. It's at midnight, man. You know what time midnight is? Nobody's up at midnight but Rosie Davis watching uh, Gunsmoke. She's the only person up at midnight. And then Trust called our house and said, Y'all in the bed? It's bedtime. Well, I don't go to bed until about 12 or 1 o'clock. I said, You don't get up till 11 o'clock either. So, so it's midnight, and you come asking me, first of all, you come and ask me for something for somebody else. And you come at the wrong time, it's at midnight. 
And he will say, do not trouble me. The door is now shut and my children are with me in bed and I cannot rise and give to you. I say to you, though he will not rise and give to him because he is his friend. Check this out. He won't give up and give to him because he's his friend. In other words, his friendship is not tight enough for him to get up at midnight. Check this. Yet, because of his persistence, King James says it's because of his inopportunity. Because of his persistence, he will rise up and give to him as many as he needs. Then he goes into this famous statement in verse number nine. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you shall find or you will find. Knock and it will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks, it will be open. Now, I don't know if you would confess it, but for years I had a problem with that one. Anybody else had a problem with that, that Bible truth right there? I, I, for years and years. I'm like, God, your word says, for me to ask. And your word says, and it shall be given or it will be given to me. Lord, your word says for me to seek and I will find. Your word says, Lord, to knock and it will be open to me. For everyone who asks receives and he who seeks find and to him who knocks, it will be open. Anybody else ever had a problem with that? Let me tell you why I had a problem with it. I know y'all sanctimonious. I know y'all Christians and y'all ain't gonna admit it, but let me let me be the heathen right now. I have a problem with it because I'm asking God and he ain't giving. I got a problem with it. I have a problem with it because I'm asking he's not giving. I have a problem with it because I'm seeking and I'm not receiving. I have a problem with it because I'm knocking and the door is not open. But keep the pericope intact. Verses 1 all the way to verse number 10 is a part. It's two different pericopes, but it's a part. You got to keep the thread running. He's talking about prayer, right? He, he compares, whether he contrasts the friend, verses 5 through 10, he contrasts this friend that won't give up, get up. But what Jesus is saying is that the God we serve will bless us regardless of the time of night. What Jesus is saying, the God we serve will bless us on behalf of blessing somebody else. You, you know the story of four friends taking Jesus' preaching and the crowd is there. And when the crowd is there, they can't get the the impotent man in the door, they bring him on a bed, they go on top of the roof and take the shingles off. We know it as shingles today. They, you take the, they tear a hole in the roof and lower him down so he can be with Jesus. In that particular pericope, we have to understand that they put forth some action and they made sacrifices for their friends. They put forth faith for their friend. Look at the text. The text here tonight says, and he says, now I got a friend that's on his journey, and I'm coming to you at midnight, and I want you to give me something at midnight. Matter of fact, I want you to get up out your bed. Mm. I want you to get up out the bed, and when you get up out the bed, I want you to bless me with what you have so I can give it to me for give it to my friend. So now he's asking a friend to bless him so he can bless a friend. Have you ever uh, told somebody to get away from you because they asked for somebody else before? Keep the pericope intact. When we pray, we ought not just pray for ourselves. We ought not just pray for our families. We ought not just pray for our friends. 
We ought to pray for other people too. So it's an opportunity for us to bless somebody. How many of you know that all your blessings that you have, all God has given you, has not, he has not given it to you just for you? It's for you to spread it around. When we fast, when we fast, when we fast, when we go on a fast, Isaiah says that we ought to take the food that we don't eat at the time and give it to somebody who's homely. We ought to take the clothing that we choose not to wear and give it to somebody else. Some people think all sides really fit all sides. Okay, let me see, can I put that in perspective? Some people think one size fit all. What did I just say? One size does not fit all. That's just a marketing scheme. But some people, you can tell, they really think that one size, size fit all. Young ladies, let me just tell you, you're not 18 anymore. Your metabolism has changed. There's nothing wrong with giving it away. Are you with me? What did I just say, Sister Brown? What did I just say? Chances are. <laughs> chances are. What am I saying, Sister Willow? Chances are. What am I saying? If you ain't gonna get back in it, give it somebody. If you've been there six months and you hadn't you hadn't tried it on, some people got three deep freezers. Y'all know what a deep freezer is? Some people have three deep freezers. They waiting on Armageddon to show up, I guess. The Bible teaches bless someone else. Bless somebody else. You can't eat it all. You can't drink it all. You can't wear it all. You can't see it all. Be a blessing. Bless somebody else. Have you blessed anybody lately? Have you been a blessing? And now let me just tell you. Don't bless somebody with something you don't want. Don't, don't just drag everything out and do your spring cleaning and give it to somebody. Take the one thing that you love the most and man, you just don't know. I had a time when I went and visited the church. Brother walks up to me and said, man, that's a nice tie. And you know, brothers know when you, they, you, you know when brothers try to be real spiritual Man, that's a nice tie there, man. It's a certain way they say it. Mm -hmm. So he leaves me no choice, but after service, to take my tie off and give it to him. Mm -hmm. Then he act like he's surprised. Oh, man. Mm -hmm. Oh, you, you gonna bless me with this? Yeah, that's what I just did. Mm -hmm. And I'm supposed to give it not grudgingly, no out of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver, right? I remember when I was growing up as a junior deacon at the Holman Street Church, I had a roommate named Randy Towns, and Randy Towns was coming in off the streets, and we were roommates, and I said, hey, man, you need some ties. So I had plenty of ties. So I gave Randy the best three ties I had, and they were $12 each. That was the best I had. I mean, those were some expensive ties. I'm talking about in the 80s. Come on, y'all. They were expensive ties. They were $12 ties. And I gave it to him. I said, man, this is what you need. Gave it to him. I, I mean, I enjoyed giving it to him. And it was not a whole week later. I go to church. Deacon Johnny Foster walks up to me and said, man, you need some new ties. I said, I sure do. <laughs> and he had three ties. I gave away three. He had three ties still in the box. 
And if you know Brother Foster's brother, Brother Miles, he left the tags on him. <laughs> <laughs> this man gave me $45 tags. I've never seen that before in my life. I've seen them in the store, but I never had any. <laughs> so after I blessed him, then he blessed me. And what you give, give more. When you plant a seed, a whole bushel of butter beans show up. I mean, some $45 ties. $45 each. Brother Whitlock, you should have seen me skip it. Oh, man. I got some. I'm rich now with ties. I got three $45 ties. And they respect brand new had not been around anybody's neck. So God, God is looking forward to us blessing others. As we pray, we ought to pray for others. So he says, this man refused to get up just because he was his friend. He says, don't trouble me. I can't rise and give to you. I say to you, this is Jesus. Jesus says, I'm saying to you that what you need to understand Though he would not rise to give because he was his friend. He did not give because he was his friend. See, spirituality goes further than friendship. When you're walking with God, you understand what God is doing. It goes further than we can even imagine or think. He said he would not give it to him because he was friend, yet because of his persistence. He will rise and give him, check this out, as many as he has need. He will give as many as he has. God will bless us to, to fit the need of somebody else. But remember, this is prayer. This is prayer. And prayer, the point here is he wants you to pray with persistence. I know some churches, they said, pray and bring it to the altar and leave it there. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you, if I really want something, I'm going to bombard heaven. Mm -hmm. I mean, the angels going to be going back and forth from earth to heaven because I'm going to say, Lord, here I am again. I'm asking again. Mm -hmm. He says, when you pray, you ought to bombard heaven. You ought to be persistent. You ought not give up. Mm -hmm. You ought to keep working. Keep looking forward to it. Prepare for it. You ought to prepare for it. Keep preparing for it. Keep, people think you're crazy when you start preparing for stuff they don't see. I mean, Noah preached over and over for years and years. It's going to rain. He started building a boat. It's going to rain. It's going to rain. Rain had never fallen from the sky. It was rain coming from the earth like a sprinkler system. It's going to rain. It's going to rain. Noah kept the faith. Kept building the ark. The rain began to fall. And when it began to rain, they knocked, the songwriter says, they knocked on the door and said, can we get in? And the songwriter said, Noah says, you cannot get in. God got the key and you can't get in. That's the kind of faith we have to have in prayer. Have to be persistent. Be persistent. Be persistent. Keep praying. Be persistent. Be persistent. Keep going. Be persistent. Pray. 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 Now don't wait till you want something to start praying and being persistent. Be persistent in your fellowship with God. God, I want to know you. Remember, verses 1 through 5 is all about knowing God and God knowing you. We not, and then when you look at Psalm 139, the Bible teaches that God showed his ways to Moses. He showed his ways to Moses, but he showed the miracles to the children of Israel. You know why? The leader has to know God's ways. Because the people are just looking for the blessings. We have to have fellowship with God so much so until we know God's ways. And when somebody comes to you and, and they tell you they got a revelation from God, you can say, no, that ain't God. Mm -hmm. You got a revelation from somewhere, <laughs> but it wasn't from God. Mm -hmm. And you know what always intrigued me is that all these modern day prophets, they only speak great things to you. 
Because speaking good things to you means ching ching. The prophets of old, they spoke stuff like this. In the morning when you wake up, in the morning when we wake up, your head will be decapitated and birds will be eaten at your neck. We don't have those kind of prophets anymore, right? Everything is uh, pretty and nice and you're going to have, you're going to be rich in the morning. God going to have money to chase you down. If you're living for money, you're already behind. When you live for favor, money will come. Amen. And see, when you have favor with God, you're not really concerned about money because you God will fix the situation where money is not a problem. Because he will give you things that won't cost you anything. It's because he's God. So our prayer should be persistent, persistent, persistent. As we end tonight, we want to make sure that we we pray for families and friends. I'm going to ask one of you to come and lead us in prayer, and then I will close us out in prayer. Just praying for family, your family, your friends, praying for people that you know need prayer. We certainly want to pray for the, the Ferguson family. Uh, Melanie Ferguson transition. When we were at Holman Street, she was Melanie Matthews. And so we want to pray for her two girls. We want to pray that God blesses, blesses her girls. And, and Melanie was my age. Some of y'all said she was old. <laughs> she was my age. And uh, people are leaving planet Earth regardless of their age. And so we want to pray for the Ferguson family. And so... Let me get one person to come and pray for, for families and friends. One person. Any volunteer want to pray for families and friends? Anybody wants to pray? We have four nights on Wednesday nights to pray. So somebody will say, let me get mine over with. I want that person to come who will pray for family and friends. Anybody. You can come as a couple. You can come individual. Uh, somebody come on and pray as we, as we come to the end of our, our night. Anybody? See one person moving? All right, that person doesn't move anymore this, this month now. Dearly Father, we just come, Father, just first of all, thanking you for your grace and thank you for your mercy, dear Heavenly Father. We come to him, Father, just asking you to forgive us of our sins, God, and we pray to Heavenly Father that you're creating us a clean and a pure heart, dear Heavenly Father. We thank you, dear God, for just being so good. We know, dear Heavenly Father, there is none like you, God. We know, dear Heavenly Father, that you're in control of everything, God. We just thank you, dear Heavenly Father, for being in control. We thank you, dear Heavenly Father, uh, for the life of Melanie, dear Heavenly Father. We pray right now, dear God, that you would just bless her family, dear Heavenly Father, that you would bless her girls, dear Heavenly Father. We pray, dear Heavenly Father, right now, that if there's someone that doesn't know you in the part of their sins, God, that they would just come to know you even in the midst of death, in the midst of being bereaved, dear Heavenly Father, because we know that you are a comforter, comforter God. We just thank you, dear Heavenly Father, Father, for just how you bless us constantly, dear God. Not only her, God, but we just pray for all the bereaved families, God. There are so many people that have lost loved ones, dear Heavenly Father, even since the beginning of this year, dear Heavenly Father. And we just pray right now, dear Heavenly Father, that you would just grant them comfort, God. We thank you, dear Heavenly Father, for your son Jesus dying on the cross for our sins, dear Heavenly Father. We thank you, dear God, for giving us eternal life even right now. Oh, God, we just praise you, God. We honor you, God, because we know that there is no other God like you. Dear Heavenly Father, we just constantly just ask you, dear Heavenly Father, just to be with us, dear Heavenly Father. We pray for the New Beginning Church, God. We pray for every member, dear Heavenly Father. We pray for our desires, God. We pray, dear Heavenly Father, for the desires that you put on the inside of us, dear Heavenly Father. And we pray, dear Heavenly Father, that we will see those things, God, uh, this year, God, that you've called us to do, God. God, we just thank you so much, dear Heavenly Father. We give you praise, we give you honor, and we give you glory. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen and thank God. Amen. If you
you're present uh, on the air or in, in the room and you've never received Jesus Christ as your Savior, this is your moment. This is an opportunity to get to know him. You can just believe the story. The story is that Jesus died on Calvary. He was buried in a barter tomb. And early that third day morning, he rose from the dead. If you would like to go to heaven, why don't you bow your head with me and invite Jesus Christ into your life. Just repeat this after me. Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life. Make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and thank God. We believe that you're on your way to heaven. If you honestly pray this prayer, believing the story that Jesus died and rose again. We thank you for joining us here tonight. We thank you for joining our Bible study. Please feel free to join us in Bible study at 715 every Wednesday night. Join us on Sunday morning for Sunday school at 9 a.m. and for our worship service at 10.30 a.m. Again, thank you for joining us. Father God, we thank you now, Lord. We bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We come to this week of prayer. We come to this moment of prayer. We come to this teaching of prayer. We ask you to be with us and bless us. Lord, we ask you to give our church a hunger and thirst for righteousness, a hunger and thirst for your word, a hunger and thirst for prayer. Bless us, Father God, to praise you in all that we do. And bless us to be souls for Jesus Christ. Bless our church to be a beacon light for others to see that we will glorify your name in everything. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling, unto him the only wise and only true God, unto him be power, be glory, and dominion. Until we meet again, let us say amen. If you want to give to the New Beginning Church, you can do, do so by giving by way of Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Uh, you can mail in your gift to P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas. That's P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. 77459. Again, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for being a part of our service. If you want to join a New Beginning Church, please let us know. We'll be glad to welcome you to the family of faith. Amen.